Hey folks, I'm not sure when we're officially going to uh, end up on YouTube. A lot of times I just kind of stand here looking dumb, waiting for the stream to start, but I thought I would start talking right away. Uh, today we're going to be interviewing Gord Baird. Gord uh, is a friend of mine. I've uh, worked with him in the past and uh, he does all sorts of things. And it's a shame we only have an hour today to actually talk about uh, all the stuff that Gord does. And Perhaps we can get him back on the show in the future because he's got a lot more to share than just uh, just about composting toilets. Um, so kind of an interesting opportunity to talk to Gord because I'm actually working on a project right now, a living building challenge uh, project here in Alberta. Uh, I think it's the first, well, we're going for full certification. Um, and I think it's the first full certified house. No, no, sorry. The third certified house. And Gord will probably be able to correct me on this because he's, probably a lot more up to date on it than I am. Uh, anyways, even if it's the fifth or the 10th, it's an incredibly hard building system to master. And the reason I'm telling you guys about this is that Gord was one of the first um, people to actually approach this building system and has uh, built an incredible house uh, in just outside of Victoria on, the, on Vancouver Island. And so he's a complete wealth of knowledge um, around sustainability and, and hence why I'm so excited to be having a conversation with him today. So if you're just signing in, guys, let us know where you're coming in from. Um, if you're interested in learning about composting toilets, I'd like to know one thing that you want to learn out of today's conversation. You can put that in the chat. Um, and one of the reasons you want to get chatting right away and keep that chat stream going is that we're going to be giving away one free copy of this bad boy right here, which is an incredible uh, tome of information around how to turn a waste resource that we're all mostly scared to talk about into an opportunity. Um, and before I, um, just to kind of preface that a little bit more, I just want to give you guys a couple of facts to think about as we're talking about this today. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, phosphorus is about to peak globally. And what that means for you is that if you like eating, one, two, three meals a day, uh, phosphorus contributes uh, significantly to the production of food globally. And some people are saying that when we, if we remove soft rock phosphorus from the system, we could reduce up to 50% of the global food production. In addition to that, we've talked to Dmitry Orlov as well as Richard Heinberg, both who think that the whole shale gas phenomena is but a fleeting moment in history. Um, and if you know how natural gas is turned into ammonia or nitrogen-based fertilizer, you'll recognize that this represents a huge risk to global food production as well. Both of these amongst a whole plethora of other issues, urban water use or rural water use, um, the energy embodied in water, um, all of these things are directly dealt with through the use of composting toilet-based systems. So they're a huge appropriate technology you can be grossed out by them all you want, but there's something that uh, something in this concept that you're going to have to directly deal with likely in the future. And so you might as well start thinking about it right now. And I can't think of a much better person to be having this conversation with today than Gord Baird. Um, and in fact, it was written by, this book was written by Gord and Anne, and uh, I'll introduce you to uh, Gord here momentarily. Sarah, did you wanna make um, an announcement about New Society? Sure. Yeah. No, as usual, we're excited to be here um, and joining in on the conversation. For those of you who don't know, New Society is an activist solutions oriented publisher. We pride ourselves on walking our talk and having the highest environmental and social standards of any publisher in North America. So this includes stuff like printing on 100% post-consumer recycled paper, printing in North America and over, never overseas. And we've been a carbon neutral company since 2006. And our employees are shareholders in the company as well. And we've also become a certified B uh, corporation. You can find out more about us um, and the books we publish um, on newsociety.com or any of our social media sites. And these are some things that people don't th think about when you pick up a book and um, look at the price. And sometimes our books are a little bit more expensive than others. Um, and that be is because of those incentives that we think it's important to do uh, business in this way. So we're thrilled to be able to collaborate with Verge, Public, uh, Verge Permaculture on this project. I think that the sharing of ideas and information on as many platforms as possible is key to creating community and real change in the world. 
And I also want to give a shout out to all of our authors, including Gord and Anne, for their willingness to share their often hard-won knowledge and expertise with readers. It can be really comforting in, when you're embarking on a new project or contemplating new and challenging ideas to know that someone has been through it before you and can walk you through it, helping to, uh, you to miss many of the potholes along the way that might reveal themselves. So thank you to Gord and to all of our new society authors and all that support getting this information out there. Awesome, thanks Sarah. So um, love all the chats coming up in the chat window. We've got a really great audience today, guys. I would love for you guys to hit that like button if you're excited about today's talk, it helps the video to track. And remember, I want to know what it is that you guys want to get out of today's talk. If you can put that in the chat window, I'd really appreciate it. Remember, the more chats you put up there, the more likely, Sarah's to, uh, more likely Sarah is to see your name and the more likely that you are going to get one of these bad boys uh, at the end of the talk. So I want to just, uh, I'm going to read Gord's um, bio here and then we'll bring him in. And I want to kind of get his uh, story from the beginning because he's he's had a really interesting um story through the years um, with regards to how he uh, has got into this and, and, and what he's currently working on and kind of what he sees into the future. So Gord, um, and he's got a bunch of, of alphabetical letters behind his name, which means he's really highly trained. I won't bother uh, saying those because it probably won't mean much to most people, but uh, he's got lots of certifications. Gordon and um, are the co-authors and designers and builders of the award-winning EcoSense home in Victoria, BC. And by the way, I put a link to his website in the show notes below, so you can check out his website. It's eco-sense.ca. And the first internationally recognized living building challenge pedal residential product, which is nothing to be, uh, I mean, it's something to be super proud of is what I was, I was getting at there. It's an incredible accomplishment. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit more about living building challenges. So Gore, why don't you come in and um, tell us how you got into this whole sustainability thing. Let's start there. <clears throat> He's, well, I fell in love with a redhead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I guess it was about, uh, almost 14 years ago, uh, Ann and I, we, we were, we were both single. We'd both be dumped. And, um, anyways, I met Ann on Lyme. And, uh, so she was living on a little golf island between Salt Spring and, and Galliano. And, uh, we met online, we hit it off. Um, I was looking for someone that could wear gum boots and no makeup and clean her own fish and carry her own kayak. And wow, somebody existed. Uh, three months after we met, we were engaged. Three months after that, we were married. Six months after that, we um, found a piece of land that we wanted to sort of build as sustainably as we could. And so we ended up uh, in this hilltop area in the highlands of Victoria, BC. So it's quite a, a, a rocky area. It's not necessarily where you'd consider permaculture. And um, through that whole process, we started to uh, build our house, which is, um, it's a cob house. So I, I often joke, I live in a mud house and I shit in a bucket. <laughs> way to start presentations. <clears throat> Captures attention. And um, in the whole process, because Ann and I are sort of quite sort of scientific and policy, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty nerdy, is we challenged the policies and uh, that has led to um, the, all the things that we've come to do, whether it's working on the provincial policies for composting toilets or building the Cobb house and dealing with the living building challenge. We're both municipal councillors, um, uh, vice chair for the CRD regional water supply, which we service 350,000 residents. Um, we run a nursery. We grow all our own food within about seven years. We've gone from growing no food being canned food of ours to now growing all our food all year round. Even with the snow, we can go out and grab our food. Um, we, we volunteer about a third of our time to the community and uh, we work about a third of our time to earn to pay for the things that we need, such as teeth and glasses and stuff like that. So um, it's been kind of an interesting journey. We've gotten a lot more exposure than we've ever expected for two introverts. And then along came New Society and wanted us to uh, write a book on compost toilets and they twisted our arms and hence, hence we have a book on compost toilets. <laughs> Is that all you do? No, it's not quite all. <laughs> <we do. laughs> but um, 
I mean, we do everything from uh, water systems designs. Uh, we work on consulting for some cities. We've just done a consulting for Metro Vancouver, which is 19 municipalities on their water systems and water conservation. Um, we do farm design for farmers. We do crop planning for farmers. We are experimenting with nut crops on the West Coast. And, and it goes on, Rob, so I won't, I won't bore you, but it continues on. We basically get to follow our passions. Everything that's sort of an integrated system, uh, we, we follow our passions and we, and we get to play with them. Nothing, nothing born in there, Gord. Um, and uh, let's let's keep digging into it a little bit. So um, let's let's actually talk a little bit about your house first. You guys have the first official pedal certified project. When did that uh, design start? When did you guys build it? And um, what were some of the uh, reasons that led you towards uh, moving to, moving towards? Uh, you're doing gray water there as well, I think. Gray water and a composting toilet. Yep. So uh, when we started out. Uh, that was, I guess we started to build the house in uh, 2008. It took us 20 months to build the house. The house is a, is a two-story load cob bearing house. It's the first legal seismically engineered one in North America. Uh, and the, we were originally going to go with straw bale. We ended up going with cob because the more we learned about straw bale in our environment, the less comfortable we were with it. Um, though I, I think straw bale is wonderful. And um, the whole idea was to try and for us to set an example as to both adaptation and mitigation with regards to carbon intensive building because carbon, carbon building or building is, is very carbon intensive. And so as we set out to, to build the house, we fell in love with Cobb and we continued on that route, um, incorporating the solar and solar hot water uh, and the, I guess the, the main driver for us to do it was to demonstrate that you could do it, that you could do something sustainably, that you could do something that wouldn't impact future generations, that would have value for future generations. Don't know if that answers your question or not, Rob. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that you, that we talked about yesterday and that, I mean, I've definitely got the sense from you in all of our conversations is the importance uh, that you place on uh, integrating systems together. And I think that maybe you can talk a little bit about how all those systems that we've talked about, I mean, everything from solar hot water, gray water, composting toilets, rainwater harvesting. Um, and then you guys are even doing, I saw, I think it was on your Facebook last year that you guys have put in a pretty substantial pond for drought mitigation. Talk about how all these systems kind of um, tie together and, uh, and and why that's so important. Well, when you think about an ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem is basically just a, a mixture of integrated systems, different living systems, whether it's bugs, fungi, plants, mycelium, whatever. When you, we are no different than the, than the ecosystem that surrounds us. And so when we try and design and live in such a way where we separate things into their individual components, things are bound to fail. So with us, what we found was to integrate systems, you know, you've got your water systems, you've got your mechanical systems, you've got your life systems. Um, and in our case, we also have our political systems. What we find is that the importance of integrating the systems is when you start to look at how things work together and, and when you start to look at the living building challenge, sometimes you don't have to have such vigorous individual component systems when things are working together. So um, you might have to have less of a mechanical system in your house. If you've got passive solar and you've got, uh, and you've got um, the ability for the house to handle moisture properly. Uh, for example, with our composting toilet, one of the ways that we meet the building code is we have our fans in our house. They give us our air changes. Our fans in our toilets give us our air changes we need in our house. So we don't need to have an HVAC system. So that's a way of, of, of doing it. Another way that we tie an integrated system together is in the summertime when we don't have enough rainwater stored, we need to pull from the well to irrigate the nursery. And the nursery is a lot of black pots. And the cold water from the ground is about six degrees Celsius. It's super cold. So if we're going to take super cold water and put it on really hot plant pots, we're going to have really unhappy plants. So what we do is on route to the nursery, 
we have some storage containers. We run all that water through the floors en route to the storage containers. We warm the water up and pre-warm the water at the same time as getting free cooling in the house. And so the plants are happier and we're happier in the house. So that's just a way of integrating systems. It's, it's thinking about how can we use something multiple times. Kind of like going kayaking. You only take something if it's got three uses. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, concept uh, to use the uh, preheating of the, the well water for, um, for cooling of the, of the home. And so let's talk a little bit about your ecosystem. Um, you're, you're living in Victoria. It's a, technically a Mediterranean climate. Can you tell us a little bit about the arc of seasons in your space and some of the design constraints that you guys have um, specifically about water? And we'll use that as kind of an entry point into composting toilets. Yeah, so one of the things that we, we normally have a, you know, in the from September on through to April, we get rains, we don't get super heavy rains, we get sort of the West Coast drizzle, that's starting to change now where we're getting more heavy rainfall periods. But once June hits, we start to go into a drought season. And we used to have about two months of drought. Uh, now we've had, uh, it's quite common to get three and four months of drought where we don't get any more than maybe one or two millimeters over the f over four months. So we're getting into a, um, a state where the summers are, are getting hotter, you know, at, at our place where we live, it's not uncommon for us to hit between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius on the hill. Wow. And so that's hot. That's super hot. I, I didn't think Victoria ever got that hot, but I guess with the microclimate and the, the elevation, that seems to... Is it that does. What's it? Yeah, so we're about seven degrees hotter than Victoria, even though we're just a few kilometers away. Crazy. And which is great for almond trees and lemon trees. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we have a soup, uh, an extreme amount of drought. So um, water conservation was critical. Um, and dealing with... Dealing with having to store water was critical. Um, so hence the reason the gray water systems came into play because we needed to irrigate our orchards. And the composting toilet made sense on a variety of different levels. One is conservation because between 20, between 20 to 25% of the normal water used in a house is flushed down the toilet. And it's crazy just to clean water and then flush it and lose it. And uh, it's, also a, uh, it's also a resource. So, and that resource is useful when you talk about phosphorus, you, you talk about losing, you, you're breaking the nutrient cycle by flushing it down the drain. So we're trying to keep that nutrient cycle on the land. Totally. You know, when I was in Australia, composting toilets are pretty common there. Um, and then when we ended up in the kind of drier regions of Australia, where there wasn't the biomass resource available, I mean, for those that know Australia, the East Coast has got quite a bit of biomass. But as you get into South Australia, uh, where things get quite a bit drier, it's, there's a lot less biomass available. Um, and some of the biomass there is actually kind of interesting in that it, uh, it'll prevent composting. So things like eucalyptus or um, there was an Asian tree there, and I'm trying to remember uh, the name of it right now, uh, privet maybe or something like that. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think about often with composting toilets is you, you really have to do that bioregional assessment. And for folks that don't know much about Vancouver Island, which is where Victoria is, um, you guys definitely are rich in biomass. You guys have all sorts of forest resources there. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that resource itself is appropriate for um, combining with, with composting toilets. Yeah. So, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to do composting toilets. Um, the, uh, we have a tremendous number of Douglas fir and all, all, we have, I mean, we've got a temperate, we've got a temperate rainforest, a West coast temperate rainforest. We've got uh, lots of Oak, a lot of Gary Oak. We have, uh, we've got Arbutus. We have a lot of cedar and, Believe it or not, cedar can still be used for biomass in your compost toilet. Um, slows it down a little bit. But we do have a tremendous amount of hay, straw. We're, we're lucky in that, in that respect. And especially when we've got our foot or two feet of snow that we got last, last couple nights, um, there's a whole bunch of wood chips that are going to be coming down the, the pipeline pretty quickly that's easily accessible for folks. We don't have a, we don't have a problem of... of garnering what we call biomass or bulking agent to use in our composting toilets. So we're, we're very lucky. Yeah. So in South Australia, that's when they would actually uh, plant 
constructed wetlands. Um, and actually that, that's a place where ironically water might make sense to use because they, they don't have the carbon resource. And so what they would do is they would basically uh, attach life plants uh, to the nitrogen phosphorus resource, which is bound in water. And then as you're doing, use that black water and then use the gray water that comes out so that it's being used at least two or three times before uh, going to sink. And so um, I think that's just an important distinction because showing up in a desert with a dry bucket toilet, if you don't have any carbon might not work unless you're gonna do some sort of a dehydration system or something like that. So this is definitely an appropriate technology for where you guys are at. Can you talk a little bit about, you said you got a well. So what kind of flow rate do you have? Does it ever dry out in the middle of the summer? Was, was moving to composting toilets um, a result of being concerned about the long-term sustainability of, of groundwater on, on an island like yours? Uh, yeah, so we do have a well. The well's 300 feet deep. Uh, flow rate's uh, five gallons a minute, which is which is fine for a household use. Um, we also have a nursery, so it's not necessarily great for the nursery. That's why we have large storage containers. Uh, are we worried about the state of the well and what's going to happen in the future? Absolutely. As we are moving into climate change uh, issues, which we're definitely seeing here, um, we have when we get our rainfalls, they come down faster and harder. They flow across the landscape. They don't get a chance to infiltrate into the ground as much. So we're not getting the same recharge that we'd normally get, even though we're getting the same rainfall. And then our dry spells are longer. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we're dealing with here is we're dealing with a mass of Douglas fir and cedar tree die off, um, which is this, this year, we've lost 55 trees this year on our seven acres to put it in perspective. So we have an extreme, extreme die off of trees. What's causing that? That's a, so basically what's happening is the Doug firs and the cedars, they, they recharge their water stores up over the winter time. And then normally they're used to two months of drought, but because it's longer, they're using up the water stores and that is then weakening them. And then we're getting fur beetle. We're getting a couple different uh, funguses that naturally exist and, and, and coexist with the trees, but they're seeing the weakened trees and they're basically taking advantage of the weakened trees. So we're seeing uh, needle drop. We're seeing uh, different, uh, different root funguses that are taking them out. So we have actually just now, one of the things I've just put forward to the whole region is a vegetation management strategy to relook at repopulating our forests with trees that are able to withstand climate change from 2050 to 2100. Uh, it's a big issue. It's a huge issue. Hmm. And so with that, um, with that change in, in climate, are you suggesting that potentially the well wells are not being recharged at the same rate that they would have historically? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so thinking about that from a resilience perspective uh, means that starting from square one with a lower water consumption is going to be better for you, but also for the region in the long run. It is um, starting with a lower. So when, when the water does disappear, we're not necessarily feeling the pinch because we've already pre-planned for that. We've already changed our habits. Mm -hmm. We've already built that in. And, you know, thanks to the works that have happened in Australia, thanks to the works that have happened in Europe, we've got lots of, of, of great resources to draw from on how to deal with water much more conscientiously. So how much water do you guys use per day per person? <laughs> do you know? So we used to use very little water, Rob. We used to use um, about 37 liters per person per day. And because we had gray water systems, we realized we weren't making enough gray water to water our plants. So we actually started to use more water, uh, which is really funny. So we, we use now probably in the range of about 70 liters of water per person per day. Mm -hmm. And people that have rainwater systems, they're normally using, you know, between 70 to 120 liters per person per day. And the average use in BC, uh, believe it or not, is between 270 to 350 liters per person per day. So we're using considerably less water than the average person. Yeah, that's about what uh, Calgary range is. I've, some numbers have been as high as 400, but um, uh, that, that's a pretty typical range for a city. And uh, just to kind of put it in perspective, in fact, I want to ask you this, what's the rainfall out there? What, what do you guys get per year? Oh, God. It, it, it changes because where Victoria is and where we are, we're in a rain shadow of the Olympic mountains. So we, um, I'm going to say that we probably get about uh, 500 to 600 millimeters a year, 
where you can drive uh, 20, 20 minutes to half an hour down the road, and it's going to be double to triple that. Wow, that's amazing. So, Gord, you played a really important role, I think, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the, in the drafting and, and ultimately the creation of this composting to- toilet um, legislation in BC. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the, the provincial government in BC and has what they call the, the sewage system regulations, the SSR. And with that, that covers things like septic systems. And the province realizing that they wanted to build in some other alternatives to the sewage system regulation, they sought out people to um, write a, basically an addendum, an attachment to the sewage system regulations for gray water systems and compost toilet systems. So because we were quite a, a visible advocate of compost toilets and gray water systems and very publicly visible, uh, they asked that we be technical editors on the manual. So there's a group of about five of us that worked on the uh, the updated manual for the province. And in 2016, that became law in the province. So since 2016, it's been legal to put in gray water systems and compost toilet systems in the, in the province of BC. So how did you get around that prior to that time frame? Did you get a special exemption? So prior to that, we had to put in a... The way that we were able to build the house was we were able to build the house and make the house what we call flush toilet ready, which is a concept we came up with to try and allow us to do what we want to do. So we had to finish the installation of a septic field that we don't use. uh, And we were able to, the composting toilet was not illegal in the province of BC. We just had to have the ability to have a flush toilet. Composting toilets, there was no There was nothing wrong with using them. Uh, So the biggest thing was making sure that we could tie in our gray water and divert it either into the septic system that we had to complete or put it into a gray water system that we that we built. So um, we were able to sort of because there was a lack of rules and regulations, we were able actually fairly easily to, um, for lack of a better term, manipulate and use sort of. logic as to allowing us to do what we want to do. Hmm. Interesting. And so how long have you guys been using a composting toilet within your homestead? Or maybe let's just go back even beyond your homestead. Have you, were you using a composting toilet before you built your current house? So Anne was, yeah. Anne introduced me to a composting toilet. And uh, so Anne was using a composting toilet five years uh, before we met. So that's what uh, she's been using one for 18 years now. Well, wow. she started off. Uh, she started off with a sort of a pre-manufactured one that you can buy in the stores. Was never able to work the bugs out of it, so she took it out and she replaced it with the bucket system or the commode batch system, which is the humanure system. And uh, we've never looked back. It's uh, it's great. Love it. Yeah, we use one out in BC as well, and um, it's it's really interesting. In fact, we used to teach our PDCs, and we had two composting toilets there. And uh, there's the, the batch system, as you as you refer to the bucket toilet. And uh, I could always tell that when people showed up and they were being asked to use one of these composting toilets, that um, that they weren't very comfortable with it because we've all had bad experiences in outhouses. And uh, but they could only hold it for about two or three days. Uh, and so because I was the one emptying them, I could always tell when my students were getting a little bit more comfortable because on day three, in between the breaks while we were teaching our courses, I'd have to run to the toilet uh, and make sure that everything was cleaned out because and ready for the next batch of students. Otherwise we'd run out of capacity. Uh, And then by the kind of middle to the end of the course, um, people were saying, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm gonna go back to flush toilets. And so once you use a sawdust based bucket toilet, um, there's almost, in my opinion, there's no going back. Um, I would personally be using one here in Calgary, but uh, they're not legal and um, (laughs) It's uh, when, when you when when you are loud, outspoken, like like you and I are, um, you got to be a little bit careful about um, uh, talking about this too loudly because you can get into a lot of trouble, um, which is why I really appreciate the way that you went about doing it. And um, um, you've kind of brought the code officials along with you all the way. And what an incredible accomplishment to be able to say now that there is a legally binding document or an addendum. Um, which allows people to literally save. Uh, I'm not sure what septic fields cost out there, but out here it's 
it's a you know twenty to forty thousand dollar investment depending on the size of the house that you build, um, and with a thirty year lifespan. Um, and so every 30 years, you're looking, it's basically a thousand dollars a year so that you can use a flush toilet plus the water, plus all the, everything else that, that goes into those systems. And so what an amazing accomplishment. And, uh, I've, I've sent that document to numerous people and, and now you guys have taken it a step further with this book and given people a stepwise approach to, um, to, to, uh, taking responsibility for their own waste. So what were some of your biggest insights in writing this book? Oh, geez. Um, <clears throat> That's a, that's a good question. Uh, so first of all, one of the biggest insights is that I've always been um, a full supporter of the bucket toilet, the one that we use. And I've always, in essence, poo-pooed different systems that either are more mechanically um, complex or systems that do urine diversion. And I think probably one of the biggest insights is that every no system is better than any other system every system has its place and has its use and it really depends on you know are you in an are you in an, a, a commercial building are you in a residence that doesn't have access to bulking agents and biomass are you do you have limited well water um do you need to use your urine in the garden do you you know how are you how can you deal with any excess moisture so all the different systems and writing the book it really opened up my eyes that I, I now don't have a prejudgment anymore of the various different systems that are out there for composting. So the, for that, it was, it was great. It removed a lot of my prejudgments. So there's a comment from Susan Risk saying, but Rob, we still have to install the septic field. And the last time I read the code was, was uh, I think it was last year. Um, and I, if I remember the code correctly, and you can correct me, Gord, because you've probably got it top of mind. Um, the use of gray water systems, which is now legal and composting toilets um, the way that it's written allows you to, to, to go with a much simpler infiltration system for dealing with gray water, um, thus avoiding the capital cost of a septic field. Is that not correct? Yeah, sure. And so just to sort of back up, there's sort of there's two types of gray water. There's light gray water that comes from laundry, bathroom, sink, showers, and that you don't need to have any sort of a filtration system that can go right to mulch basins. And then you have dark gray water that comes from your kitchen sink. And so there's two ways of dealing with the dark gray. One is you can have a little miniature kind of like a little miniature septic field where you've got a little miniature tank that allows for uh, to allow for biological activity of that dark gray water. Um, we're just doing some research now on a gray water system that uses uh, worms that we've been using for our dark gray water. And then there's also, as you mentioned, the, um, the constructed wetlands and constructed wetlands for dark gray water is also excellent. Uh, so you don't need to have the conventional septic system, not in BC. So what, let's go through um, the process from start to finish on your composting toilet. So you go to the bathroom, you sit down on your, uh, I guess it's not a porcelain pony, it'd be your plywood pony or whatever wood material you're using. And uh, you do the deed, the bucket fills up. Um, and every time it fills up, you're, you're putting sawdust on top of it. From that point on, once you've got a full bucket, can you take us through the full life cycle of a composting toilet system on your, on your homestead or homesteads that you're designing for other people? Yeah. And, and I got to say that a lot of them don't actually use our bucket system either. We've, we've got many different types of compost toilets that have gone in at different, different places. But the way that ours in particular works is our cabinet has two buckets in it. When one bucket is full, of uh, shavings, pea, and feces. We swap it with the empty one. And when it gets full, I take them outside. I put a lid on them. I bring in two empty ones. And then every Saturday or every second Saturday, what I'll do is I'll go out to our compost pile. We have, we have two compost piles. One compost pile is active that we add to every week. The other compost pile is the one that is sitting dormant. So every week or every two weeks, I'll go out to the active compost pile. I'll open it up. I'll put our stinky stuff in first, which is all our kitchen scraps. And then I'll cover it over with the buckets from our compost toilet, cover it over, put new straw or hay on top, stick my thermometer in, and then I'll watch the temperature spike. So our temperature in our compost pile spikes up to, um, so the, the highest we've seen it is 172 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gets pretty hot. So it will go between, basically between 120 to 100, on average, 120 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then after we add to that pile for a year, then we let that pile sit dormant for a year. And then it's that period of sitting dormant when the cool temperatures arrive and the fungus comes in and breaks down the ligands, the insects come back in, the worms come back in and they continue to break down the materials. But what it also does is it gives time for any potential pathogens to naturally die off over time because pathogens, there's two things that kill pathogens, time and temperature. And if you assume that temperature is not on your side, then if you let it sit for a year in our climate, then just a year's worth of time will allow it to, to kill the pathogens. At the end of that time, you've got material that you can use. Um, we actually give it one additional composting procedure because we've got so many gardens on such a big acreage that compost toilet um, or compost materials won't go very far on a big acreage. They'll be great in a smaller in a smaller lot. So what we do is we use it to its highest advantage and we recompost it with chicken manure because what happens is normally our compost, when we compost it, all the manure from our urine is used to basically for the biology to basically consume carbon and, and nitrogen. And so we have something that doesn't have very much nitrogen left over at the end of the day. It's got all the minerals, the phosphorus, things like that. But what we do uh, in our secondary compost for our own benefit is we add chicken manure to it. We compost it for a second year and then we sift it and we use that for seed starting. So we use it uh, primarily for sort of the highest, highest end use. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I'd love to see some photos of your project, but before we bring those up um, and then and then close out this conversation, um, what are the commercial systems that you recommend in your opinion? So if you're in a tiny house, we do a lot of tiny houses. We do a lot of retrofits for houses that have flush toilets and are looking to put in composting toilets and when there's a lot of RVs. So systems that work really well in, in those cases are going to be things like the separate toilet or the nature's head toilet or the airhead toilet. Um, those are the three off the top, which are simple. Uh, I'm just, I've just done up a new design for a new, new house that's going in and they have got jet vacuum flush toilets that basically, if you've ever been in a vacuum flush toilet and you flush it and it's, it's you know, you don't close your legs because it'll suck your innards out. Um, Do they operate at Mach 1? They can operate at Mach 1, and, uh, but what's also is they can operate, because they're so energy efficient, they can also operate on an off-grid system. Nice. Um, which is nice. And that will take the materials from the toilet and put it into something like a Phoenix composter or a Clivus Multrum composter or a um, Biovert or any one of the other types of composters that are out there. There are so the jet is separate from the end point unit that you're actually doing the, the composting in. Yeah, so you can actually mix and match different things. So in the compost toilet, you've got your processor and that might be a compost pile like what we have, or you might have um, a compost processor inside a house that is uh, like a Phoenix system. Right. And so there's many different ways of getting your material from your bathroom to that compost processor, whether that's carrying the bucket outside or whether that's um, having it drop through a chute into it or whether that's sucking it out or sending using foam to allow it to slide through the pipes to get to it. So there's your pedestal, your conveyance and your processor and then the end juice. So there's, a, there's many different ways of combining it. And the, and the book talks about how to do that too. That's the nice thing is it looks at how you can compare how you pair different things and, and what meets your needs. Awesome. That's great. So um, I, I'm sure folks would love to see some of the stuff you've got going on there. Do you have a couple of photos you could quickly share with the, with the audience? Sure. I'll, I'll pull something up here. And, and uh, so while, uh, while Gord's doing that, guys, uh, make sure you're putting up comments and uh, questions. We're going to go to Q&A here really soon. And uh, I know that Sarah is actively looking for uh, the best comment out there because we're going to give a book away here shortly. And uh, so start thinking about the questions that you want to ask Gord. He's obviously, after listening to this conversation, you can tell that he's a complete wealth of information. Um, I hire, hire Gord on a, a fairly regular basis um, when I need help on in domains that uh, I'm not great at. And uh, I, I can always trust to, that I'm going to have a great conversation with him because he's, he's so full of information on so many domains, as you can see, from policy to gray water to black water and it just doesn't end 
which is why I'm probably going to have him back on the show in the future. So Gord's just bringing up, uh, just seeing a black screen there, Gord. You're um, just seeing a black screen. Okay, let's. I will see if I can. Do you see anything there? Um, I think it's I'm just waiting for YouTube to catch up here. Just give me two seconds. We'll just, uh, I'm going to come on over to the. No, I don't see. I don't see anything on the Zoom side. So you might want to unshare and then reshare again. Bring my window. To... Let's try this one more time, Rob. Okay. Can you see anything? Oh, there we go. Yep. Perfect. So I think that one there. Um, I, that's a picture of the outside of the house that you're looking at, is it? Uh, we see the solar thermal array. And solar the, thermal array, so you're looking at a living roof and a bunch of sweet potatoes on the roof. Yeah. Yeah, so we uh, we, we try and use uh, this. This is a part of our rainwater catchment system, living roof and food growing. Um, and uh, when I scroll through, Rob, can you see a picture of the bathroom on your screen now? Not yet, no. How about now? There we go. Okay. Oh, went too far. One back. One back. So what right now, see? right now, I see the outside of your house there, the the cob planters or the cement planters, and uh, and a staircase. Okay. <laughs> So there, that should be a picture of the bathroom that you see. Uh, no, it's still the front of the house. Still the front of the house. Well, I will try this. Technology is uh, something that I love, but also, as you can see, I, I can be challenged with it too. Right? Oh, it's okay. You're doing great. There we go. There. Okay. So there's a picture of uh, one of our bathrooms. Um, again, it's, it's a, uh, Basically, it's a plywood bin. Inside, there's two buckets and a shavings bucket on one side and earthen countertops, earthen floors. Awesome. Uh, see if we can pull something else up here for you. Feel free to talk as I'm sharing too, Rob. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, for folks that don't know what cob is, cob is uh, made out of clay and sand, uh, usually some straw for tensile as well. And so basically, uh, Gord built... In fact, I would call it a carbon storing building. I think that uh, I bet you there's embodied carbon in the actual building itself. It's interesting. Chris Magwood and I were just talking not that long ago, and um, we were talking about spray foam and and EPS and um, you know conventional building materials. And in spite of them being energy efficient and not letting a lot of energy out, um, the minute that you deploy any of those materials, the house will never actually catch up in energy savings. It, it, it's always going to be in in debt basically. I think it takes a hundred years to, to come back from, from foam. And so what you're looking at is a building that is made, it's indigenous to, to its place or very close to its place. Um, and everything in there is, is, is natural. It looks like And if you've met, did you guys get the materials tab on the, or our pedal on the living building challenge? It's close. Um, what picture are you looking at right now? We're on the kitchen right now. We're on the kitchen. So uh, about 99% of the materials was recycled or um, FSC. Mm -hmm. We didn't make the materials list because the bamboo that you see in the ceiling traveled too far. Uh, but uh, 12 two by 12s that weren't FSC. Um, so we didn't quite make the materials pedal, but we did make the, the red list, which means that we were able to avoid the, I think it's what, 26 toxic chemicals. Right. Um, so it's, uh, but everything, you know, everything that's in here, we've done, we, we've done by hand. So we, uh, we hired an electrician, we hired a plumber and then all the cabinetry, carpentry, all the cob building, we, Ann and I pretty much did, did a hundred percent ourselves. Did you guys use PVC plumbing pipe? We, um, we didn't use PVC plumbing pipe. We did use some recycled PVC for some of the uh, gray water, but we didn't buy any. Uh, so most of the stuff we used was uh, high density polyethylene um, and um, 
there was some ABS that we were able to use. So we didn't, we didn't have to deal with the PVC. And to this day, uh, we, we try not and use PVC if we don't have to, because PVC, the, the nature of PVC, making a PVC um, is, put, puts, a, puts a lot of nasties into the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Sarah, well, have you, have you uh, chosen a lucky uh, recipient for this incredible book? I have actually, I, I'm just been reading all the comments. So I kind of got <laughs> looking at the pretty pictures, but today's winner is uh, Susan Riss. Awesome. Great. So Susan, uh, I'll put my email address up in the chat window um, and you can send us an email and then we'll make sure that Sarah gets it and, uh, and she'll uh, get that, uh, that book out to you. It sounds like you're probably in British Columbia. So if you can opt either for an e-copy or a hard copy, uh, depending on, um, what you'd like. Um, and so you guys can find access to getting the book. There's a link in the show notes below. Um, and once uh, every every week, we provide a coupon code for 48 hours after the, um, after the show, if you want to get a discount on the, the book itself. Um, if you want to be notified about future shows, make sure you're on our newsletter list. Um, that information is also in the show notes below. We've got a lot of really great authors coming up on all sorts of essential sustainable building topics, um, as well as things related to permaculture. Um, so that's great. Um, we're excited to be to be doing this. It's, it's amazing to be able to talk with guys like Gord. So let's go to questions for a little bit. I'm just going to scroll back up into the comments and uh, capture some uh, some juicy ones here and see what uh, what we can throw at Gord. Um, and I've got I've got the first question. So what's what's the biggest insight you've had over the uh, period of time that you've been composting? Like amazing plant growth. Like what what's really the thing that stands out most for you on your composting journey? The 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 biggest thing is that they don't stink, and I love them, and I can't stand using the flush toilet. So that's probably one of the biggest insights. Um, but we've kind of already talked about that. Uh, one of the other things that um, has been really interesting in the composting journey, I guess an insight, is more so watching uh, there being an absolute change in public perception around them, where it's no longer a phobia. Uh, people are no longer grossed out. I can take materials into the classrooms and the kids want to touch it and smell it. We get it tested, of course. We make sure that it's, it's food grade. Um, the... I guess the other thing that I have come to realize is that uh, it is, we treat it uh, so very differently. We treat it like it's, like it's gold, actually. Um, we, and I, I mentioned that we save it for its highest use. So we don't just want to use it um, copiously. We want to use it sparingly. We use it to re-inoculate after the winter and our, our winter rains wash our soils. We take a little bit of the compost. We put a little bit of the compost in all our gardens to re-inoculate all the life forms in the garden once we get above 10 degrees Celsius. So we use it to sort of to, to rebuild the life forms and get them going because we think that it really has an impact on decreasing the issues of pests when we have a much broader uh, number of life forms in the garden um, in terms of in terms of growth i would say that because we don't use it as a fertilizer we don't necessarily see it in terms of growth we see it more in terms of pests and we also use it when we're starting seeds for the nursery we find that we don't have the mold issues or some of the other damping off issues that you would otherwise see in regular regular materials there seems to be something in there that that is good um, so there's just odd little things that you just pick up over time that we that we like, whether it's the public perception or whether it's or whether it's how we use it and what we use it on, because there just seems to be uh, less problems with with its use on certain things. Cool. So Faiz asks, are there any composting toilets um, or any other technology that can handle occasional water use? Some of my guests prefer to use water, but this only happens a few times per year. Sure. So uh, I mentioned a jet vacuum toilet. So that's uh, one that uses a little bit of water. People feel very comfortable with being able to push a button and having things wash away. So it uses something like about a, uh, a couple teaspoons of water. Um, 
There are moldering toilets. So I've just done up a system for a campground where people can, if, 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 if people had to flush, what happens is the urine, the feces and any moisture goes into a, basically in essence, like a great big wheelie bin that's got a drain system on it. Drain system is hooked to in essence, like a little leachate field or a little tiny little septic field. And then when the bin gets full, you swap them and you just leave the materials into the bin to store for a long time, two years or so. And a system like that can handle water. So there's a, there's a bunch of different systems that can handle water inputs. And, um, and you can use different types of toilet pedestals combined to different types of collection containers. So it's, yeah, so there's definitely a lot in there. I, to recommend one is, is hard to say because there's so many different options that you can look at. Right. Okay. Oswald asks, um, do you have an estimate on the money that you've saved in water slash plumbing um, based on implementing your system? And so I wonder if there is any savings just because you were forced to put that septic field in being the first, uh, first past the post. Two answers to this. So in our case, um, sometimes when you're first past the post, there's no savings. Um, but we, I would say that in our case, there were, there were no money savings for putting it in because we did have to put the septic system in. If you are doing something yourself, and I'm assuming that there's going to be a lot of people that are, you know, watching this that are do-it-yourself permaculture folks that won't need to go through the regulatory process, it can save you a lot of money because you, you save yourself, you know, you might spend between setting up a proper composting bin system and a toilet, you might spend $1,000 versus the $30,000. If you're having to go through the regulatory system, um, there's still a cost savings, but a lot less cost savings because if you're the regulatory system, one of the biggest costs is not so much the, the system itself, it's a lot of the design fees and the liability insurance that, uh, that a designer has to cover. So, you know, on a $30,000 system, you might be spending maybe Seventeen to twenty thousand dollars for a composting system tied to a gray water system. So, you'll save a little bit of money on a regulatory. You'll save a lot of money if you're doing it yourself. And in our case, we didn't save any money. Okay, thanks for that. That's great. Um, how do you keep animals out of the compost pile? Asks Mark Berg. Well, um, we're generally when you've got because we run a thermophilic compost pile, we don't generally have animals that want to climb into that compost pile. Uh, we've had, you know, many dogs, we've got all kinds of critters around here. And it's just because things don't rot and become stinky, like a, like a methane, like an anaerobic compost pile, it's, it's not stinky. And there's, so there's not really any attractants. Uh, you know, we can throw a dead chicken into the compost pile that normally we'd eat it, but if we don't eat it and it goes in the compost pile, it's gone in four days. It doesn't rot, it gets consumed. So there's, there's no attractants there, but best practice is that if you do have a compost pile or a place that you're processing your compost is to have a little fence around it. You don't want kids to go in and play in the worms. That's, you know, there's certain things that you just sort of <laughs> plan for because worms are fun to play with. Um, and we don't want to get other types of worms. So, uh, but generally the only thing that happens is on a snowy day like this, um, we might see the odd rat. I know you guys have no rats in Alberta. <laughs> all in BC. Um, and so uh, this year we haven't had to worry about setting a trap, but last year I think we probably had to catch five or six rats and we compost them. So Nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Just a few more questions here. So Susan Risks asks, we are on year eight with humanure and find that we need more humanure composting bins than Joe Jenkins. They fill up faster. Can you speak to this a little? Is the temperature moisture balance sensitive? Okay. So um, I would love to ask a couple questions in response to that to answer it, but not necessarily having that. So the, the compost bins generally... Um, if your temperature, like if you've got two people, you might not be making enough compost to get to the temperatures that would consume the compost pile as quick as if you had four or six people. So in a case like that, you might have three composting systems, each one being about a, a one and a half cubic meters, you know, one and a half cubic meters, uh, 
Um, I've been using IBC totes to make composters. So that's a cubic meter. So you might need to have three or four of those. Um, and the other thing is, is the amount of shavings you're putting in there. Some people are fine to put less shavings into their compost bin. Some people want to put more shavings into their compost bin. If you put more shavings in, um, it means that you're going to have more, you're going to have more volume that you've got to compost. And there's nothing wrong with either. But if you are finding that your composting bins aren't meeting your needs, then it's okay just to ramp it up with, with another one. Okay, cool. Um, okay, any suggestions on what government body to deal with in the States to find out if we need permission to do this? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is that um, in the States, one of the things that came out in 2018, and this is a really useful tool before you even go and talk to the authorities that you're dealing with in your county or um, whoever is dealing with the, the state um, sewage system regulations. And it might be a health, might be a health authority. But IATMO, which is one of the um, associations that makes the pump plumbing regulations in the US that we also draw upon from in Canada, they have got a new standard called the IATMO WE stand, which is the water efficiency standard. And in the water efficiency standard, they have got a section on composting toilets. And as of writing the book, the very first toilet to meet the new WE stand, the IATMO WE stand, was the humanure composting toilet system. So if you're going to speak to a regulator, a regulator in your county, in your state, who deals with um, sewage systems, if you can point to that IATMO standard, then what it does is it gives them confidence that there is a authority that they rely on that's already put information out there that they can use to draw upon if they don't have any regulations that, that would surround it. So you can actually use that work to help lead the way. Fantastic. So Gord, just quickly, one of my last questions, do you guys offer courses and or tours of your property? And if so, when and how can people find out information about that? Yep. Um, so we do offer uh, we do offer courses. We are we've offered less tours because we needed to get some of our lives back. There's been a lot of publicity over the years. But um, what we do have is we have got a web page which is eco-sense.ca, and we have a listing there of any workshops that are coming up and so those workshops can range in from gray water rainwater compost toilets responsible water uh, grafting uh, nut trees uh, nut farming and so if people sign up to our website they'll get the updates or they can always just look at it online and see if, if there's any upcoming workshops awesome all right folks well that wraps up the interview for today <clears throat> i've got a frog in my throat uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. We had a really great audience today. Lots of comments, lots of really great comments. Um, and so I'm really uh, thrilled that you guys could all join us for uh, the interview with, with Gord. Um, like he said, check out his website, eco-sense.ca. Lots of great info there and uh, highly recommend signing up to his newsletter. And uh, if you found this uh, live stream valuable, I'd love it if you hit the like button. It helps it to track. Um, if you're not on our newsletter and you want to be notified about future uh, interviews that we're doing about things like rammed earth, hempcrete, straw bale panels, rainwater harvesting, anything related to permaculture, livestock farming, all of those things, we're going to be covering those in the next 12 months. Make sure that you are on our newsletter and you can get there by going to vergepermaculture.ca and waiting for the pop-up, or you can actually go to the link that's in the show notes below. And uh, if you guys found this useful and somebody that you know should be made aware of composting toilets, then make sure you hit the share button. And I highly, highly, highly recommend going out and buying this book. If you're, even if you don't consider buying comp or putting a compost to toilet in right now, I'm gonna tell you, leave you guys with a short story quickly and then we'll uh, put some closing comments in there from Gord and Sarah. But um, the thing is, is that our, our, our water, sorry, our sewer systems, generally speaking, rely on electricity. And we've all been through or seen uh, people that have been through the 50 million person uh, sewage, sorry, power outage on the east coast of Canada, uh, Ontario, basically, in Quebec. Um, 
it's unbelievable how few people know how to process their own sewage. And it's really not that big of a step. In fact, it's less gross than wiping crap out of your baby's butt if, you, if you've been a parent. Um, this is an essential skill that every human should have. Even if you're not going to adopt a composting toilet right now, there are some basic heuristics, basic rules of thumb that you need to know about in order to be able to deal with this. And one of the reasons that I think composting toilets in gray water has been so slow to be adopted is that we adopted flush-based toilets as a result of um, to get rid of the bubonic plague and all of the other sanitary issues that evolved um, as a result of humans not dealing with their waste properly. This is something every human should know, and I think this should be on every person's bookshelf um, so that in the event that something like the 2013 flood in Calgary, they almost shut the entire water system down. We came within three hours of not having a functional water system, which would have meant the evacuation of the city of 1.2 million people. So it is absolutely ridiculous that we don't have resilient systems for things that are absolutely essential, which is hence why the uh, title on this book is Essential Composting Toilet. So um, I'm giving a, a three thumbs up. I only have two thumbs, but if I had a third, I'd give a th third one to this book. I highly recommend you check it out. You can find all the information in the show notes below and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Gord and Sarah, do you have any last comments before we close out today? Well, Rob, I'll say that uh, listening to listening to that, um, I have to say that the one city that actually has taught people how to do it for an emergency is Portland. So they actually, wow. there's a whole, so we're starting to see cities pull forward on that. Um, I will say one last thing and I, and I appreciate the, um, I really do appreciate the platform that you've offered with shared information with, with folks and uh, I, not to tout the book, but I find that the book has actually become my resource on my desk. So now when I've got, when I've got people that are coming to see me to consult, it makes a lot of sense for them to give them the book and save them a lot of consulting fees. And hopefully it's actually an interesting read. We read, we really, did try to make it uh, quite attainable for a wide variety of folks, and uh, and I I actually I actually enjoy it, and I usually don't enjoy the things I do. <laughs> there you go, Sarah. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you, and it's great to get to talk to Gord and Rob, and I feel pretty uh, it's, it's pretty great to be um, involved in these conversations and to get to have these um, sort of in depth conversations about the books and to share that information. So thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Awesome. Okay. Thanks guys. Uh, YouTube have a fantastic week and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Uh, what's the, is the next one? Did I see it's uh, rammed earth construction? Is that right? Yeah. It, no, it's uh, Kelly Hart uh, earth bank construction, earth bank construction. So uh, make sure you sign up to our list. And the next one we're going to talk about is earth bank construction. I can almost guarantee that uh, I will get Gord back on this show because I think we have about 50 more topics to talk about. And it was a really enjoyable conversation for me. So thanks Gord. Thanks Sarah. We'll see you guys in the next